There are some of you here this morning that are barely here this morning. And by that, I mean some of you are hanging on to what you may consider faith. Some of you are struggling. Some of you may be even crying during the music, if not externally, internally. It's a good place to be this morning. God's word's going to speak to you. Let's pray. Lord, you care for us even when we suffer, especially when we suffer. You care for us when we struggle in sin, especially when we struggle in sin. You came to save sinners. And I just ask that you would speak right now. Many of us came here this morning not even knowing what in the world the sermon was going to be on, wondering what Romans 4 has to say to them. May they feel as if you're speaking just to them this morning, though you're speaking to all of us. May you have a target on their hearts, all of us, each of us, for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Do you have anything going on right now that is attempting to disrupt or shake your faith? Is there anything going on right now where you were going good with God, but then something happened and you feel a little bit rattled? What is throwing you off? These things usually fall into three different categories, very common to all of us. It's the idea of relationships can throw our faith off, finances, or our health. Any relationships right now that are just kind of causing you to struggle in your faith? Maybe it's with your spouse. Maybe it's with one of your grown children. Maybe there's something going on with somebody else that is impacting your relationship with God and you're wondering, what's going on? And some of you are struggling in your faith because of finances. You thought by this point in your life you would have more money to give, to share, to even provide for yourself, and you're having issues with your finances that's messing up your thinking with regard to God. And then there's the idea of your health. We all could be strong in our faith until our health starts to be off just a little bit, and then a lot of it, and then it really causes us in our relationship with God to be a little shaky. So those are the things I think that tends to disrupt many of us, relationships, finances, health. But I want to add a fourth category that is probably my biggest faith disruptor. And I want to call it existential angst or an existential crisis. This tends to mess with me quite often where I feel like I am wasting my life. I fear that I'm choosing comfort over Christ. I'm serving money rather than God. I'm pursuing safety rather than sacrifice. And I'm serving myself rather than others. And my faith gets disrupted and shaken when I think, hey, am I wasting my life? Or maybe I am wasting my life. Am I even a believer? Of course, I'm a preacher, but that doesn't mean I'm a believer. And these thoughts keep going around in my head, shaking around in my head. My faith gets a little wobbly. Is anybody else with me. So this morning, I want to talk about faith, unwavering faith, with a a little asterisk. Can we do that? Talk about unwavering faith with an asterisk. And the reason I want to put a little asterisk on that that unwavering faith is because I want to qualify and further explain unwavering faith. Because many of us think that when we read the Bible, the people in the Bible have perfect faith. Have you read the Bible? I mean, sometimes we feel that way, right? That we've got to have perfect faith. Sometimes we just look at other people, we go, man, they have the best faith. They're so stable and I'm so wobbly and, and their faith is perfect. It's not mine. I just want to give up. It, it's like me with my, my 16-year-old son. 
he, he plays this game called pickleball at a very high level. And my game compared to his game is trash. I don't have the skills that he has at pickleball. And I should think to myself, since I don't have those skills, then I might as well not even play. And many of us think that that way here this morning. You think, oh, the person in front of me or behind me, or even the preacher, he has such better faith than me. And since I can't match that faith, which seems so great, I might as well not even participate in this thing called being a Christian. That's why we need to talk about unwavering faith with an asterisk. Because unwavering faith does not mean perfect faith. And that's what we're going to see as we look at Romans 4. So let's look at Romans 4. I'm sure you all remember when we were in Romans 4 last month. Abraham was justified by faith and not by works. And it wasn't his works that gained him a right standing before God, but it was through faith. Now what we're going to do today is we're going to reflect upon the faith of Abraham and we're going to be called to imitate his faith. We should trust God's promises with unwavering faith like Abraham. Now, I want to kind of summarize. Let me just do this. It's like a two-part sermon. First part's really quick, and then second part, a little bit longer. As you see in verses 9 through 17, which Jim just read, it's saying, Abraham's true children are those who have faith in Christ. Abraham's true children are Jews who are circumcised who believe in Jesus and Gentiles who are uncircumcised who believe in Jesus. And so that's kind of a summary of 9 through 17 that Abraham believed was declared righteous and his circumcision was a sign and confirmation of the righteousness he had by faith. He was declared righteous through faith alone. This is the argument we started making last month, okay? This is kind of a summary here. We've, we've covered this ground before. That we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and the finished work of Christ alone. Got that? We're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and the finished work of Christ alone. Which means we are declared righteous, right standing before God, accepted by him through faith. And this is very helpful and this is great news for all of us in here, and especially of those who have a bent toward self-atonement. Now, there's anyone in here who regrets their past, some of the things they've done in the past, and they feel like they need to make up for all the stuff they've done wrong in the past, and they have a bent toward self-atonement. And if you have a bent toward self-atonement, that will wear you out always trying to keep going to please God, to please other. And I want to tell you this morning, you can relax, you can rest, because you do not have to do good works to get God's approval. You can do good works because you already have it. Do you understand the gospel distinction there? We don't do good works to get his approval. We do them because we already have it. Because Christ's atonement was sufficient. So that's part one of the sermon. That was just a rehashing of what we've, we've done so far in Romans. But I want us to move on in Romans in the second part of the sermon. We're going to look at 17 through 25. Because, I want to make sure you hear me now. We're declared righteous through faith. We have this justifying faith. But get this, our justifying faith goes on a journey. We don't just have faith once. Yes, we're declared righteous by faith, but we continue in faith because our justifying faith goes on a journey as Abraham's faith went on a journey. And let's see a little bit of what his faith was like and what it means that he had unwavering faith and we'll see what our faith should be like as well. All right, you ready for this? Romans 4, look at verse 17 in the middle. In the presence of him whom he believed, even God who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist, verse 18, in hope against hope he believed so that he might become a father of many nations according to that 
which had been spoken, so shall your descendants be. Without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body, now as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old, in the deadness of Sarah's womb. Yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully assured that what God had promised, he was able to perform. Now, did you notice the phrase at the beginning of verse 18? In hope against hope, he believed. In the human realm, there was no reason for Abraham to be hopeful that he would have a son and countless descendants because we are told in verse 19 that his body was as good as dead. Anybody feel like your body is good as dead? Anybody? You're not even 100 years old yet. He felt this way. He was 100 years old. In addition, his wife was old as well and barren. So the promise is, Abraham, you're going to have a descendant, many descendants. It's going to come from you and Sarah. And by the way, she's never had a baby before. You're 100. She's 90. Uh, He's probably thinking, how's this going to work? I'm not going to make any funny comments or anything about that. All right? You can make your own funny jokes. All right? But the circumstances here were screaming that there was no hope at all. And yet, he was hopeful because he's not locked in on the circumstances, but he's locked in on God. He believed that he would become the father of many nations. And he was locked in on God who could pull off this promise because we see in verse 17, look at verse 17 once again. It says, in the presence of him whom he believed, even God, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence things which do not exist. So Abraham believed that God who would bring life out of Abraham's dead body and Sarah's barren womb. He believed that God who created the world when there was nothing, so God would one day call into existence descendants who would fill the earth and sit in the pews of Hot Springs Village, Arkansas. He believed this. He didn't experience it, but he was locked in on God's promises. Now, right now, I know some of you and your circumstances are screaming that you have no hope at all and you're pretty discouraged with some things that are going on in your life. I'm not telling you to have faith that it may be defined as breezy optimism. Just be optimistic and things will turn around. I'm not telling you to have enough faith and so your circumstances will change. We're not talking about having faith in faith. I am telling you there is a certain way to live where things seem impossible that you can have faith in God's promises and be locked in on him. Example, I'm gonna give you four, all right? I'm gonna give you four. Right now, there are some things going on where we experience death and suffering all around. I don't know about you, but I I really feel like I am surrounded by death and pain sometimes. It may be the nature of uh, my, just the nature of my calling. It's just I'm around a lot of pain and suffering. I know what's out there and then people die. And and that can be very discouraging. And I can be saying, God, is any of this ever going to change? Well, the promise of God is that one day we will be free from pain and suffering. Guarantee it. And so faith in the present doesn't get discouraged, but believes that that will one day be true. And so me, as a pastor, I see a lot of death, a lot of suffering. I have to realize this is not the end of the story. There is going to be freedom from this pain and suffering for those who believe one day. Now, the second promise I want to tell here here is that God promises that if you trust in him, you've been declared righteous in his sight. But that gets disrupted when I realize that I'm a, still, I'm a sinner who sins. And if, maybe you are too. And if you feel your sin and you feel like, oh, you've tripped up once again, faith believes and comes to the Lord and confesses that believes that we are forgiven and declared righteous by faith. So we have a promise of God of eternal life. We can live by faith now, but that's coming. 
We have a promise of God that we are forgiven, declared righteous in Christ. Even when we sin, we can find forgiveness. And another promise of God, believe it or not, he basically says, the greatest among you will be your servant. So to be a great person among you, you're to be a, a servant. This is especially important when you're serving difficult people, perhaps the person you're sitting next to right now. He says you, you, you serve them and love them and believing that God is telling you the greatest among you will be your servant. And the fourth thing that's a promise of God is that he's working all things for your good. Everything he's working out for your good. This may be one of the hardest ones to believe when things are not working out the way you expect them to work out. But faith in the promises of God says, God, my life's a mess. This is the way I not planned it, but I'm gonna rest in you and your promises. And this brings us to the concept of your unwavering faith with an asterisk. And here we go. Verse 20, look at it. Look at Abraham. Verse 20 says, he, in the middle, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God. Abraham did not waver in unbelief. Really? Abraham didn't waver in his faith? Have you read the story of Abraham and Sarah anticipating the promises of God to be fulfilled? And the introduction of a woman called, huh, who? Hagar. Sarah had an Egyptian slave named Hagar, and Sarah encouraged Abraham to have a child with her, and perhaps Abraham is thinking, that's the way God's going to do it. So temporarily, it seemed that Abraham believed the Hagar solution, that Hagar was going to be the solution. And they had a child together named Ishmael. Not a good move, not the solution. And yet Paul says, no unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God. Do you see that? Unwavering faith does not mean perfect faith. Abraham's faith, his trajectory was in the promises of God, but he got sidetracked on this Hagar solution. And I, 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 can, I think if I'm reading you right and I'm reading myself right, some of us can have lapses in our faith where we believe the Hagar solution. My last church, tons of college students. I would meet with them in my office. I would preach. I would talk to them. I would say, marry a believer. Marry a believer. Only date believers. Only date believers. And they shake their head. And yes, yes, yes. We believe in the promises of God that he wants me to marry a believer. Until time comes. And they figure that they will come up with a Hagar solution. That they will date an unbeliever and turn it into missionary dating. It's a Hagar solution. And many of us have Hagar solutions too. And and it's interesting, January is a month where people tend to try to fix things in their life. They don't like the way things are going, and they'll try to make changes. Don't like the church they're at, they'll switch churches. I would say January is the month where I get more complaints from people in the church than any other month. Because people say, I have a Hagar solution for you. People think, I need a Hagar solution in my own life. I don't like the way my life is going. I need to move. Moving will be good. Well, I need to get a different job. that's, That's the solution in my life. I need to go and do another vacation, another cruise. That's going to fix what's going on in me. It's a Hagar solution after Hagar solution after Hagar solution. And yet, we are called that even when we can't fix things in our lives, we're to trust God and be unwavering in our faith. So what in the world did Abraham do? He went to the Hagar solution. That didn't work out so well. What did he do? How did he remain strong in his faith? Look at verse 20. 
Yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in his faith, giving glory to God and being fully assured that he, that what God had promised, he was able to perform. Therefore, it was also credited to him as righteousness. So Abraham grew strong in his faith. He waited for the fulfillment of of the promise. By the way, do you know how long Abraham had to wait from the time that he made that promise that he would have a son, have descendants, by the time it was finally fulfilled? Does anybody know? Well, let me tell you, it was about 25 years. How are you doing in your waiting? How are you with waiting? This holiday and Christmas season has seen a lot of flights be disrupted and people being flung different places and having to wait in certain airports. My wife and I, not too long ago, were headed off to to Key West, Florida. We went from Little Rock to Charlotte. All were going good. Now we're headed to Key West. We're on a plane. We're 30 minutes from the airport. Pilot comes on and says, we're having some safety issues at the airport. We are going to have to divert our flight to Miami, and you're going to have to stay there for a night. Bummer. Worse places to be than Miami. But we were diverted. How many of you feel like your whole life is one big diversion. You like you have a plan, you're going, you get diverted, and then you're stuck there waiting, waiting, waiting. And then you feel like you're almost going to get to where you want to be and dealing with something. It's almost there, and then you're diverted again. Abraham, waiting 25 years. And the text tells us that he grew strong in his faith. How in the world do you grow strong in your faith? And the world would tell you, well, the way you grow strong is what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Not in the Bible. You're like, really? It's not in the Bible? I thought that was in there. No, it's not in the Bible. So how does your faith grow stronger? Well, not through what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Well, what we see in Abraham is that his faith grew strong, get this, as he gave glory to God. I want you to see it. I want you to see it. Verse 20, verse 20 says, he did not waver in unbelief, but, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God. Because he was fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised So his heart disposition says, God, you're going to do it. I don't see it. I'm waiting. I did that little diversion thing with Hagar. That didn't work out. But I'm believing you, God, that you're going to bring life to these dead bodies. You're going to create descendants out of nothing. You will do it. So his faith is growing stronger. He's giving glory to God, even though he doesn't see it. He's saying, God, you're going to do it. And that's the way our faith grows And it's strengthened as we stand confident in the promises of God. That's the way it grows. It's kind of like working out and lifting weights. I hate lifting weights, as you can tell. I was a tennis player. Back in the day, tennis players don't do weights. And the thing that I hate the most is the bench press. Makes no sense to me. You push up. And then it falls back down on you. And then you have to push up again. And then it falls back down again. I think the point is to build muscles. But that is a very good description of what it looks like in the life of faith. A temptation comes our way and it pushes on us. And we stand strong in the promises of God and we push back and say, no, no, I'm not going there today. And your faith grows strong. Or there's something that goes on that your future is so uncertain that you need to be full of anxiety and worry. Anybody full of anxiety and worry in the future? So that's being pushed on you and you push back and you say, not today, Satan. I'm going to trust in God. I'm going to trust he's got me. I'm not going to be full of anxiety and worry. I'm going to trust. You see how that works? Let's go back and forth. And so your, your faith is strengthened as you give glory to God. 
Your faith is not shrinking when you go, well, I guess I'm not dead yet, so now I must be stronger. What doesn't kill me makes me strong. No, no, no. Your faith is strengthened as you say, God, I'm going to stand on your promises. I'm going to stand on your word. I'm going to stand on your truth. No matter what happens, I'm going to push back. And your faith grows strong. Now notice this as we finish up here, that the faith is not faith in faith, but it's faith centered in the death and resurrection of Jesus. Look at verse 23. Now, not for his sake only was it written that it was credit to him, but for our sake also to whom it will be credited as those who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He who was delivered over because of our transgressions and was raised because of our justification. Now here we're starting to see the connection of Abraham's faith with our faith. So when we put our faith in Jesus, we are exercising similar faith to Abraham. And these words it says here, it was counted to him, were not just recorded for Abraham, but for us as well who put our faith in Jesus. So here it is, put it together. Just as Abraham was counted righteous through faith, so will we. And as our faith goes on this justifying journey, plays out, we believe the God who could bring life from the dead. Abraham believed that. So we also believe God who raises Jesus from the dead. And this is the gospel, okay? This is what the gospel comes down to. That we believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for sinners, was buried, and rose again. And we stake our faith and claim on that that he gives life by faith to those who trust him. That on the cross, Jesus bore the penalty for your sin rather than on us. And he was raised on the third day. Those who believe can be forgiven, declared righteous, and live forever. That's the good news. And so if you find yourself many years after believing that good news wobbly in your faith, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to come back to where you originally started and keep your eyes on Jesus. Yes, it's Jesus who is the one who was crucified for your sin. Wobbling your faith, come back for that. Jesus who was the one who raised from the dead. You can rest in him and his promises. Right now, things may be hard. Things may be painful. You can continue to strengthen your faith by coming back to Christ. God's sovereignty, God's plan, working for your good no matter what. And so if you're here this morning with this unwavering faith, with an asterisk, you are not alone because faith in the Lord is not a perfect faith. And so what I want to do is I'm going to leave you with something that I find very helpful when I'm struggling in my faith. It is a five-word prayer. And before I show you the prayer, it's only five words. You can handle this. I want to tell you where this prayer comes from, okay? It goes like this. There was this man who had a son, and his son was, let's just go ahead and say it. His son was demon-possessed. And at times, the demon would, would cause the boy to convulse and foam at the mouth and grind his teeth and become rigid. And this guy couldn't get Jesus' disciples to cast out the demon, And, of course, Jesus rebukes his disciples for the lack of faith. So this this man brings this son of his to Jesus. And Jesus is like, how long has he been like this? Well, the man says, well, you know, when he was a little boy, the demon tried to throw him into the water to drown him. Or the demon tried to throw him into the fire to burn him. And the man says, "Uh, Jesus, you know, it'd be great to heal him, if you can. Isn't that interesting? Jesus, would be really great if you could do this for this boy of mine, get rid of the demon, if you can. And Jesus is like, if I can? If I can? Are you serious? If I can? And, and he says, all things are possible for him who believes. And then the man does this (laughs) five-word prayer. I believe. Help my unbelief. What a combo, right? I believe. Absolutely help my unbelief. 
That right there is unwavering faith with an asterisk. That right there is my life. That right there is your life. And yet, even that right there, that faith right there, I believe, help my belief, Jesus cast out the demon. You may be wavering your faith. You may be thinking, I'm so worthless. I got terrible faith. I believe. Help my unbelief. Some of you who are stuck in some of your Hagar solutions right now need to come out of those and say, I believe. Help my unbelief. Some of you who are waiting, you've been diverted. You're stuck in the airport of life. I believe. Help my unbelief. And that's the prayer we want to land on. And that's the prayer we want to pray right now. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, you have promised us eternal life, free from pain and suffering. Right now, we see a lot of suffering and pain, and some of us feel it right now. I believe. Help my unbelief. There's coming a day when you're going to turn it around. Lord, your promises declare that we're righteous through faith in Christ. But right now, many of us have messed up again this weekend, even, even this morning. I believe. Help my unbelief to trust you who welcomes some sinners and forgives. Lord, you've promised that serving others that we're going to be rewarded. But I get so irritated with people. I get so aggravated with people. I curse them in my heart. I believe, Lord, help my unbelief that you will be rewarding those who serve. And Lord, you promise that you're going to work good in all things, even things like divorce or infertility or unemployment, long hospital stays, cancer that won't go away. I believe. Help my unbelief that you're working for good, no matter what. Lord, help us all to have this unwavering faith of Abraham. It's not perfect, but it's not locked in on us, but locked in on you and your promises. I believe, help my unbelief. Amen.